Revelation chapter 2. Good to be here this morning. Glad to be in God's house. Um, I paid a visit to Brother Ron Dagonia yesterday. I was down at his church fixing some things on their streaming computer and so on. And lo and behold, I end up, I got to preach down there next Sunday. Next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, I will be at, what's the name of his church? Church of Many Blessings, yeah. Down in Fredericktown. Uh, we'll still be here Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon, 3 o'clock. Then I'll leave and head down to Fredericktown. It's about an hour drive down there. And um, he told me the story. There's some couple of drywall hangers that used to work for him back in the day. And I knew these guys. They were the Wagner brothers. And there was Barry and Daryl. You know them? There you, it doesn't surprise me. Everybody in Fredericktown's Rose cousin. We used to tease them, called them Barry, Daryl, and his other brother, Daryl. And these guys would come in. You know, they make adjustable benches for drywall hangers so that when they're hanging sheetrock on the ceiling, they can lift it up and put it on their heads and hold it up with their head. You adjust the bench to your height. You hold it up with your head and you can nail it off. Well, these guys didn't do that. They had Prairie Farms milk crates with their tools in it. They dumped the milk crates out, put their tools on, stand on those milk crates and stiff arm that drywall all day long. As soon as I saw that, they were Mr. Barry and Mr. Daryl. But anyway, they started going to Ron's church and they heard a guy at another church preach about the, the many things that are wrong with the NIV. And Ron says... I know a guy. And when he brought their names up, I said, oh, yeah, I remember them. And uh, so I, I never would have thought they would have been your cousins, but it doesn't surprise me. So anyway, uh, I got invited down next Sunday night, six o'clock, going to teach them why the King James is right, why those other ones are in error. And um, the next Watchman broadcast, which I don't have ready yet, uh, I'm going to be dealing with that issue because Second Peter chapter two, Peter said that they will even the false teachers will number one deny the Lord that bought them, and there is a lot of that going around. When you deny the work of Christ on the cross, and you and you will deny the word of God. They two go hand in hand. Jesus, uh, Paul warned about another Jesus and another gospel, and they always go together. If it's a different gospel, I guarantee you it's going to be something's wrong with this Bible. That's what they're going to say. So anyway, um, I'm, ex I'm looking, looking forward to going down there and telling them that. But then, Pe then Peter said, they'll deny the Lord that bought them. And then they'll, he, they'll speak evil of the way of truth. The way of truth is the Bible. That exact phrase is found in Psalm 119. And the way of truth is God's word, and they will speak evil against it. Anybody that says, uh, the Bible's wrong, I'm right, and this is what I went through in Bible college. I learned that all the Bibles were wrong, every one of them. And it was up to me to be the Greek expert or the Hebrew expert. So, how many pastors do you think are in America? 20,000, 100,000. So I know us preachers well enough to know that if that's the case, then you have 100,000 different opinions upon any given verse in the Bible. If it's left up to us to translate it, I know what I did back in the day. I deliberately altered what the Bible said to make myself look important to everybody. You don't know the Bible. I went to Bible college. I'm the expert. I, I'm just telling you what was in my mind at the time. And uh, God chasing that out of me years ago. All right. Revelation chapter two, verse seven. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches to him that overcometh. Will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God that refers later on 
We see the tree of life in the book of Revelation. Um, and I know I started on this last Sunday, but I want to complete it this morning. Um, let's go to, I know, let's go to Mark chapter four. We left off here last Sunday. We're going to launch from here and move forward because there's a, these are prophecies. Jesus is telling what is going to happen. You have uh, the parable of the seed and the sower. Matthew chapter 13, practically all the parables in Matthew 13 are about the seed of the word of God. You have the parable of the seed of the sower. You have the parable of the mustard seed. You have the parable of um, the wheat and the tares. And all of them deal with the Bible issue. One critic of the King James the esteemed doctor, James White, who wrote a book about the issue, the King James Only Controversy, he hates King James people. He hates them. You can hear it when he speaks. But he said that there is no scripture evidence that Satan's plan was to ever alter the word of God or corrupt it. Now, is he telling the truth? No. The very first thing the devil did in this world Genesis chapter 3, yea, hath God said, he questioned God's word, then he said, thou shalt not surely die. He reversed God's word, for God doth know he gave something besides God's word. He gave a fake gospel to Eve, promised her that. So... All you got to do is look in the scriptures and you can see that everything that the devil does is to somehow, some way, separate the believer from God's word. In the parable of this wheat and the tares, the sower goes out and sows the wheat. But what does the enemy do? The same night he comes out and sows tares in among the wheat. He sows in corruptible seed, poison, because tares are called poison darnel. And there's a fungus that grows on these tares, on the seed of these tares, that when ingested, number one, it's an intoxicant, makes you crazy in your mind. Number two, it kills you when ingested. So Satan's plan all along was to destroy Christ, the living word of God, and the Bible, the living word of God. Both of them are the same. For the word of God is quick, which means alive and powerful. So he says in verse uh, 14 of Mark, four, uh, Mark 4, the sower soweth the word. And then he says, verse 16, and these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground. This is somebody who pretends to get saved. Pretends. They pretend. And then the preacher preaches something out of the Bible that they refuse to believe. Like the guy refusing to believe Genesis 1 was literal because he was a high school science teacher and he was smarter. And he chewed his pastor out. I know the pastor. I know the man that did it. Chewed that man out after that service and said, I can't believe you're that ignorant to believe Genesis 1-1 or Genesis 1 is real. He pretended to believe and then... When they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure, but for a time. And what happens? Persecution or tribulation arises. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And since they bear no fruit, they wither and cast out and are burned in the fire. Now, 2 Timothy, the two things I mentioned earlier that Peter said, number one, they will um, deny the Lord that bought them. And so you have statements like by so-called evangelical leaders, some of the new emergent church pastors who are saying things like, I refuse to believe in a God who abuses his own son for somebody else's sake. That's the way they put it. 
Because Isaiah 53 clearly says it pleased God to bruise him. Meaning Christ. So do we believe that? Yes. Did it satisfy the just demands of God? Yes. Was Christ an unwilling participant in that? No. He willingly came. He said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me to do thy will, O God. He, he went along with it because of his love for us. And so you have statements like that from evangelical leaders. Uh, Charles Stanley's son. What's his name? Andy Stanley. Huge heretic. Tremendous heretic. Falling way far from even his father's footsteps. Denying the Lord that bought them. And then by whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. That means they will hate the word of God. Second Timothy chapter four. Um, let's pick up the context of that. Verse three. For the time will come. And let's go. To, let's read verse verse two. Preach the word. Preach what? The book, the word, not my words, not the words of philosophers and politicians across the world throughout history, but preach the word of God. Be instant in season and out of season. That means be ready to preach deer season, squirrel season, rabbit season, turkey season, baseball season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And uh, I can tell you, it's not easy. It is, especially nowadays, it is not easy to preach, reprove, rebuke, which I have a problem with. I have a problem. I don't think I correct people. Um, exhort with all long suffering. For the time and doctrine, he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine it means they won't believe the word of God. They won't. They don't want to hear it. In other words. So why does a person choose to go to a church? Where they will hear only what pleases them. Only what sounds good to them why would they choose that you and then you have yep guys like rick warren who at one time i was going to follow i was going to do what he said so i could have a mega church and rick warren made statements like we can no longer believe that prayer alone will build a vibrant living church and i'm going that's the only way i know how it's the only way i know how I had a conversation with a fellow pastor down at camp one year. He was a good friend of mine. And um, I was, he came to me. I was reading the Bible and he had a copy of the Purpose Driven Church. And he asked me, he said, have you read that? I said, well, I've seen it. I've looked at it, read a few things out of it. I said, but it's not for me. And he said to me, well, why not? We have to do something. We've got to get people in. And that was a mistake that I had already made that God corrected me on. It is not my job to get them in or to bring them in. God reminded me of that years ago. It is a responsibility to preach the word, to declare it openly to all the world. But it's not my responsibility to bring converts in. God clearly is the one who does that. God is the one who chooses these people. And it left me feeling pretty down in the dumps. And then I read, I, I walked away. I, I mean, it wasn't, I didn't get mad at him or nothing. But after our conversation was over, I walked away and, and I said, God, is that true? You'll have to show me in your word. And I opened up to Deuteronomy chapter 7. And... Um, God said in Deuteronomy 7, 6, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number. It's not about getting the most people in our church. 
more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people. But why did God choose us? But because the Lord loved you. And because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know ye, know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. Not me. Not anybody else. Not Rick Warren. Not Billy Graham. Not the Pope. He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. And God dealt with me and said, Mike, you preach the word. You do what I ask you to do, and I'll take care of everything else. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, which means his ways of doing things. And all these things shall be added unto you. So the emergent pastors now seeking to gain the admiration of a very wicked and adulterous generation will say and do practically anything to get people to come in to the church building. They will throw out the hymn books, throw out the word of God because that offends people. Rick Warren bragged, bragged that he could preach an entire sermon series on repentance, but not, and no one would ever figure it out that he was doing it. And I'm going, what's the purpose? That's called, and there was some Bible study literature that I got a hold of years ago back when I wasn't right, called from serendipity publishing. Do you know what the word serendipity means? We don't use that word anymore. Do you know what it means? You've heard the word, right? Serendipity. Yeah. It means that you're in line at Walmart and you look down and you saw 10 bucks laying on the floor. So I put my foot on it <laughs> to cover it up <laughs> and waited till they were gone. <laughs> and I went, oh, look, I found $10. <laughs> I know. It means you found it by chance and weren't looking for it. Is that how God is? Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open. Ask and it shall be given. Okay? So the whole idea behind serendipity publishing was to give life coaching lessons to people without letting them know that the Bible was somehow some way attached to it or religion was attached to it. Okay? And they had some great ideas. But it was, then I found out Serendipity Publishing is a Catholic publishing company. I went, eh, that ain't right. But they make, they will say anything, they will do anything. Rick Warren going out canvassing Orange County, California, one of the wealthiest counties in the world, asking those people, what would it take to get you in my church? And whatever they said, he did. They said, we don't want to feel guilty. I'm not going to make you feel guilty. We don't want to hear about the blood. I'm not going to say anything about the blood. We don't want to be told how wrong we are. I'm not going to do that either. Yes? They also preach postmodernism big time. And they also, a lot of these guys, uh, they, they, don't even, they don't put as money as any Roman chapter of Romans. They want to take it completely out of the Bible. Sure. They don't put a cross up anywhere, no religious symbolism anywhere because that might offend somebody. Well, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. It is going to be an offense to those who hate it. And I'm a young man and God is whipping me up and down over this. I mean, beating me hard for wanting to follow this nonsense. And it's all about, they said, we don't teach doctrine. We teach God's love. Well, does it matter what somebody believes about God? Yes. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They'll come visit our church. They'll sit. And then they'll never come back. Why? Because we teach the Bible. But after their own lusts, that's their motivation for it. Not enduring sound doctrine is a symptom. The disease is lust. Be careful, ladies and gentlemen, about your lust, what you lust after. Be careful. Because it will alter what you believe. Sin will lie to you and it will do it every single time. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. 
They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables like Honey the Circle Maker, Mark Batterson, uh, pastor of some church in Washington, D.C., doesn't get his doctrine from the Bible. He went to Jewish fables, a story about a man, a Jewish sage that in a time of great drought, walked outside, drew a circle in the ground and stood in and said, I'm God, I'm not moving from this circle until you make it rain. And so he stood and stood and stood and stood and stood and finally it rained. So Mark Batterson tells everybody, go around drawing circles, draw a circle and then stand in it and say, God, I'm not moving until you do this. That's borderline witchcraft is what it is. It is borderline witchcraft. It is saying that, yeah, casting circles is a big time witch ritual. Big time. You must cast a circle and get in it or the devils will tear you. The dragons will tear you up, they say. The dragons that are at the four corners, north, south, east and west. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned into fables. The gospel according to Harry Potter. Believe it or not, that's a book. That's a book. The gospel according to J.R.R. Tolkien. That's a book. Teaching moral principles, moral lessons in Sunday school classes. Teaching them to read books on witchcraft and sorcery and wizardry. Saying, oh, Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, he's Christ. Because he dies and is, rises again. Now he's Gandalf the White. No. No, he's a wizard. We're not supposed to follow them who go after wizards. We're not supposed to do that. Um, C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was a non-believer. And he was friends with J.R.R. Tolkien, who was a Roman Catholic. And one night, Lewis went over to Tolkien's house, and they're smoking pipes and drinking brandy. And J.R.R. Tolkien is going to lead C.S. Lewis to Jesus by giving him mythology. So he tells the myth of Apollos, he tells the myth of Bacchus, he tells the myth of Dionysus, he tells the myth of Quetzalcoatl, he tells all of these mythological demigods throughout history saying they're actually a picture of Christ who dies for a cause and is born again or is awaiting to be risen again. And by doing that, C.S. Lewis says, I'm a believer now. So was he a believer in Christ or was he a believer in fables? And that's why he wrote some of the things he wrote, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He wrote those things to teach through by, by giving fables out, trying to teach doctrine. Um, a lesser known series that he wrote was called um, The Space Trilogy. And he wrote three books in that trilogy, and I've read them both. I've read them all three. My aunt gave them to me when I was a teenager. And I was really into science fiction then, and I read them. And I could see that Lewis is trying to teach Bible ideas in this sort of science fiction sort of way. But those are fables. Can we tell people the truth by teaching them something that's a lie? No. Give them the word of God. So in the last days, they're going to turn away from all this. They'll turn into fables, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. My responsibility and my role here is to tell you what's in this book and try my best to stop teaching things of this world. And I don't know sometimes that I do a good job at that, but that is my responsibility is to teach what's in this book and let God take care of the rest. Second Thessalonians chapter one, turn there. Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse four. Paul said, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye what? Endure. Are we having a hard time? Yes. 
are we going to have a more difficult time? They're beating Trump in every lawsuit without even hearing it. Supreme Court denied the state of Texas lawsuit without even hearing it. Turned him down. All the cards are stacked in their favor. And more than likely, they're going to win. It'll surprise me now if Trump wins and he's still president. So if that's the case, they've already shown this in Canada and they're going to do it here. You have not seen a lockdown yet. You've not seen it yet. Worse things are coming and they don't care. Do they care about your vote? They don't have to. Because they, they why, why was it that, figure it out. Why were they saying back in 2016 that Donald Trump will not be president? Guaranteed, 100% guaranteed. Pelosi said 100% guaranteed. Why were they saying that? Because they had it set up then to cheat. They did it this year. And they have all the judges, all the attorney generals. They got everybody on their side. And how do you do that? Well, they got one congressman that Pelosi's trying to cover up for who they know was in bed with a known Chinese spy. They know it. And now they're looking into others around the country that China has infiltrated. And it's, that's how it's done. Um, Ron told me a story of, of a guy that he has some sort of responsibility in Congress. Has to do with money appropriations or making sure that Congress does everything by the book. He got elected to this office or appointed to this office. He gets in the office. Two senators, two ranking senators come into his office the next day, sit down with him, and they said, here's how everything works. You will do what we tell you to do. You will approve what we tell you to approve. You will deny what we tell you to deny, and you'll go along with this. Or, number one, you won't be reelected. And number two, we will destroy your life. Because I guarantee you, guy gets elected to Congress. Next thing you know, they've got dirty pictures on him. Guaranteed. That's how it works. And the persecutions and the tribulations are coming. Now, we don't like to hear things like that. But it's true. And so Paul said, verse 5, this is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Did our forefathers suffer? Will we? Yes. Will we make it? Not by our own strength. So don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Because if God wants you to endure and God wants you to be saved, you are saved. If God strengthens you, you are strengthened. Uh, seeing it as a righteous thing with God, verse 6, to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled. Think about, think about this statement. Why is God allowing them to trouble and persecute us? <clears throat> Why did God wake Pharaoh up in Exodus 14? Why did God go to Pharaoh and harden Pharaoh's heart and then Pharaoh says, why did I let those Jews go? That was stupid. I'm going to go get, I'm going to go kill every one of them. God hardened Pharaoh's heart, brought him over to where the Israelites were camped out. Hardened Pharaoh's heart. Pharaoh's going to slay every one of them. They're backed up against the Red Sea. They have no place to go. They can't go back because Pharaoh's going to kill them. They can't go forward because of the Red Sea. And what did God do? He opened it up. Let them go through and he used them as bait to bring Pharaoh and his army down into the Red Sea. And God used that scenario to destroy their enemies permanently. Wouldn't you like your enemies destroyed permanently? Permanently. 
So you never have to worry about, are you going to do this again? Are you going to do that again? Are you going to go back to those old? You never have to worry about that again. God does that. And so his plan is to give them the opportunity to persecute us so that God can kill them for persecuting us. We're the stink bait. And they can't pass up good stink bait. Amen? If you, if you don't know what that means, go to Walmart and open up a can of catfish bait. Stink bait. Whew! Catfish love it. Um, in verse 7, to you who are troubled, the word troubled often goes with tribulation. Troubling times. Rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Those angels are what's mentioned in Matthew 24 when he sends those angels out to gather us together uh, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. How do you obey the gospel? You believe it. Who hath believed our report? Verse 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction? It's a destruction that lasts forever. It never ends. They're not obliterated in the lake of fire. They are continued they're, they're like the living dead in the lake of fire. It's an everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Hebrews 12, beautiful chapter, explains a lot of things that we wonder about. Am I saved? Yes, but what if I... Still sin every now and then is God. Uh, can I confess those sins again? Or I heard some guys say that God won't forgive them again. Or if I repeat a sin, God won't forgive me or whatever. How does God deal with sin in a saint's life? Hebrews 12 verse three, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Did Jesus have them that hated him? Absolutely. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. We haven't died for our faith. We haven't spilled our blood for Jesus' sake. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. That's what makes us brethren dealing with you as with sons for what son is he whom the father chasteneth not my dad never whipped me he didn't have to he whipped melissa once just once right but if you be without chastisement whereof all are partakers then are ye bastards and not sons. It means you have no inheritance. That's what a bastard is. No inheritance. You don't have the will coming to you. The testament. You don't have that. Because you would not endure the chastening. And that's something that... There's been, <laughs> there's been times when I said, God, you need to get me for that. That's a good attitude. If you'll chasten yourself, God won't have to. He always knows. God always knows whether you're sorry or not. I've had people call me over the years struggling. Pastor, I don't know if I'm saved. I said, did you ask God to take this sin away from you? Yeah. Did you mean it? Yeah. I said, God knows if you did. And if you ask God to take it away and you meant it, is God waiting for you to take it away yourself? No. You ask God to because you couldn't. Therefore, wait on the Lord and endure his chastening. Because he'll correct us. Amen. Father, bless your word. We thank you for it. Pray to God you'd open our eyes. Help us to see. Help us to live what's in this book. Pray to your God that you would anoint it. God, it would go with us throughout this week. 
Ble- we don't know what's coming in this world. We don't know what's coming in this country. It doesn't look good. So, Father, this is the time when we have to call upon you and rely upon you. And, Father, I think I'd rather have it that way because I need that. Bless your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen.